so let's recap. So we want to predict whether two proteins interact and interact means that they touch each other in, th in 3D so, and they touch each other only for some period of time. So they come together. They're not expressed together. They're two different entities that meet in the cell. Now we showed that there is a difference in interface types. So in which types of residues interface between proteins as opposed to the types of residues that interface within one protein. Within one protein here is in green, internal uh, between two proteins that come together is red, and between two different sort of really different regions in the protein that come together. It's in blue here. The bars differ, this is the 20 amino acids. Uh, the zero means as expected by chance, and you see that all bars differ. In order to establish that this is significant, we introduced a test, we discussed this, and the difference is really is absolutely significant. In fact, we can even say that the differences are between six different types of interfaces. Uh, what we can establish, however, is that the differences are statistically significant, not scientifically significant. So scientifically significant ultimately implies that we can use it for something else. That we can apply this or that we can gain from this tool that we have developed here if we, for instance, use it as a prediction method or as a statistical method to do something with it. Now, this difference here about correlation and causation I'd like to bring up in a, in a simple story here. Uh, those, is the, those are data from 1971 to 2000 collected in some uh, state in the north of Germany, so-called Lower Saxony. And what it shows you is how the number of babies born in a particular local district changes over the years. Okay. Now you can call this constant, you can call there's a decrease, there's an increase, whatever you call it, right? The neat thing, do you have another way of looking at it? Um, so the, the neat thing about it here is when you look at the same district and you overlay the number of storks per year, you see an absolutely clear correlation. Okay, So this is the difference between correlation and causation. This is the difference between statistically significant and scientifically significant. So some of you may believe this is really, no, you will not, I don't believe there's anybody in the room who takes this as a proof that finally we established that the number of storks or that the babies are brought by the storks. Uh, as some people in English or German speaking countries argue or even French speaking countries do. Um, so for those of you who do not know the story, so it's very simple, the storks bring the babies and from this correlation you see that in fact this, this statement, is, this fairy tale is true. Uh, now you're all smiling or many people in the room are smiling who know this fairy tale or have been smiling since a while. Uh, but these two curves are absolutely correlated. That is no chance event here, and this is the danger of data, all right? So you have a background knowledge that know, knows that these two things have nothing to do with each other, and that this is a random correlation. But if you just look at random numbers, this is a significant correlation. The random numbers in this particular case, okay, you, you, you take the entire Germany, you find one district where these numbers are correlated. But how do you know that this, the data that you're looking at are not chosen like that, if you have an assumption? You typically what you do is you use, you start with the hypothesis and then you see whether the data supports those, this hypothesis. In this particular case, it would, all right? So ultimately, you have to have a, a meaningful scientific model. And again, for centuries, people had a meaningful scientific model, and that would have been proven through those data here. Uh, you may call it a joke or whatever. Uh, it's a funny story, certainly. It, it's the kind of thing you do as a first, first slide in the new year. Uh, but actually, it's a trap. It's not easy to avoid this if you only look at the data. There's nothing in here. Just mining the data. Nothing gives away that this is nonsense. Okay? You need an overall idea. 
And the problem is, typically, you use the data to verify that your overall idea is right. Okay? That's the danger in this story. So you get into a vicious circle. Okay. Um, so, just for the record, I did not try to say that babies are brought by storks, okay? Uh, this is not at all true. What I did show, however, last year was that if we only use this statistically significant uh, difference between amino acids in different types of interfaces, we can predict the interface type. So we can predict just from sequence which residues at the interface of a transient protein-protein interaction. Okay? I don't need to know structure. I just put in the sequence and I find, I do not know what it, it is binding partner is. All I find is that these couple of residues here are at the interface to another protein. And for some, coverage here is about 5% here. For about 1 20th of all the residues, I get an accuracy here of roughly 50 something percent. For a twentieth of all the residues, I can predict that they are in a protein-protein interface at an accuracy of 50-50. Okay, slightly about 50. This is much more than random. Uh, it's not a high number, but it's much more than random. Now, the curve here has been drawn by, so underneath there was a neural network that had one unit that said it is in a protein-protein interface, one that said it's not in a protein-protein interface. If you don't remember how we use sequence here as an input, just listen to that lecture again. And when the in both of these cases, protein-protein interface residue is predicted here. In this one, is a stronger one, and the stronger ones are more on the left here. Okay, so the, when I predict fewer residues, then I predict only the ones that are very, very reliable, or that I'm very that have a very high difference between these two scores, right? Therefore, these are on the left. So the highest ones here go somehow up. Now, random is the background here, and what I showed is when we use the evolutionary signal and all kinds of other features, then we get a method that is way better than this. Not only does it always beat random, uh, but it reaches fairly high level of, of significance up there, and those, in fact, are hotspots. Hotspots are what sort of is the most important point to, with the most important residues to maintain protein protein interactions, experimentally measured here in, in red, predicted in purple. Put upon the structure that had not been used here uh, as, a, as an example, uh, as input to, to that prediction. Um, typically when you get something such as this, in many cases you may argue this is enough to publish, it, it would be better to sort of see this is one case where it works here, that happened to be the first one that we tried. Uh, what about other cases, here are some other cases, and it shows that for some at least, the prediction performance is really right. Now, let's get back into the pairs. So far, we have predicted that a particular residue is involved in a protein protein interaction. Not knowing the structure, not knowing the interaction, the pairing partner. All right. All I wanted to say is this residue is marked, this looks like one that would interact. Okay? Now, the task of today and Thursday will be to predict the pairing. Okay? And before I get into that, I'd like to slightly go back into prediction as the acid test for understanding. What about machine learning? Is machine learning understanding? Well, typically what you have is this image. Many people assume that machine learning is like black magic. Uh, it's not really medieval black magic, but most scientists see it just the same way, except for they replace this medieval image that, that I use here, or this one, uh, by something that they call a black box. Ultimately, it's the same thing. Okay, whatever name you apply to it, it is something that is closed up. Uh, it is something that you do not understand. Um, now, in order to extract some knowledge from the data, what is absolutely essential is that you do some sort of cross-validation. Cross-validation means you take all the data that you have and you split it into two. And for one part of the data, you hide it under the table. You, pre you pretend that you do not know that part. Why do you have to do that? Yeah? 
see if the <coughs> well, if you build a model, you want to see if it generalizes to unseen data, so you don't do overfitting. So, is there any other way in which you could do it? So, first of all, you throw away data from today. Secondly, by sort of splitting the data from today, you assume that all the data from tomorrow looks like the part that you have under the table, right? Is there any other way in which you could do it? Make up data. Make up, data. <laughs> yes. And in fact, uh, I believe you said that before, right? Uh, um, this is something, it's, uh, in, many, in many examples, this does work. Uh, in many other examples, it doesn't. Ultimately, the question is, how good can you make up data? Now, how good means how, how much do you sort of simulate tomorrow's data? And now comes the, the crucial bit. For instance, in this particular case that, that we're talking about here, we're trying to break protein-protein interactions. So somehow, if I want to artificially bring up interactions, then I have to predict them. And making up data only works if my prediction method is already better than the experiment. Right? Then I could hope that making up data helps me. Now, for that, we need to at least get a model that is so good that you're better than something else today. For protein interactions, we're not quite there yet. What else could we do? Actually, for none of the topics that I discussed. So, for the prediction of subcellular localization, there are experiments that are less accurate now than the, uh, the best prediction methods. That does now happen uh, because prediction methods have become very accurate and hi some high throughput experiments are just not careful enough or care whatever you, you say, they don't spend enough resources on doing it. So there are examples where, where predictions become better. In those examples, actually, you would improve sort of making up new data and retraining a model over taking a lot of these high throughput data that is, has low reliability. That would be an example where, where that approach would be better. Uh, but even in that environment, currently we believe the best thing there would be to only rely on the good data. So not make up data, but rely on what you know is very, very reliable. Back to the question, what else could you do? So the, what everybody does for cross validation is they take the data they have and they split it. Or the, in some cases they make up data, yes, that's true. What else could you do? Well, it's not really like an improvement if you can use a k-fold splitting. That is just the same thing, right? You, yeah, I didn't, when I said you take the data and you, you, you split it, I did not talk about k, I did not talk about how often you split it. Uh, so no, no, that's not my question. How, how else could you do it? Is there a principal other way where you, which you could do it? <clears throat> wait for new data, like in the Swiss release or something? That is one way of doing it, yes. And it sounds maybe funny, but typically your thesis will take some time. And over the course of this, during this time, so the good news is when, when you're close to submitting your thesis, there will be new data available. The bad news is typically you don't have at that deadline point, you don't have time to think about anything other than writing and get the thesis out there. That is the downside to the story. But in principle, uh, that would be one way. So find the data that has become available while you were working on it. Right? And this is something that you, if wherever you can do that, you should try to do that. Yes? What if it's not enough? So, we have uh, some, you may have observed in the slides that I showed about log tree 2 or log tree 3, some of those had error estimates that were extremely high. And that was because when we compared it to other methods, we looked at data that had become available very recently, and that was new. So not only data that was new, but that was also, also orthogonal to all the proteins. So it was not similar by some sequence comparison to any protein that had been known before. And then suddenly we had a very, very small data set. And in a very, very small data set, so we came to the point where we could say, well, numerically, some methods are better than others, but within the error, bars, we cannot say that. Uh, so in that, in that case, you may argue it has not brought you much. But I'd argue that for you as a person who develops a method, 
if within the error bars you find that numerically it's somehow similar to what you expected. So you put, no matter what your k was here in the k-fold cross-validation, you put something under the table and you do a typical cross-validation and you get the number n. And then you get your new data set and you get n with an error that is 20% or 30, plus minus 20 or 30%. At least you see the n and you would be happy. So at least that is achieved, and it is more than that. It's something that you should also put into a publication. It's an additional suggestion that you're on the right track. That's the downside. So this is the worst thing that can happen to you, that the error bar is so big. Now, what happens if... So here's another thing, and again, that has happened to us. Um, Black disappeared over the years again. Uh, so in your typical cross validation, you get a number of 72 percent or something like that, and then you do your new data set, and the new data set says 65 plus minus, and here it's a plus minus three percent, say, and then you have plus minus 30. So because this is such a small data set, now what I try to say here is within the error bar, you're still clearly uh, right in the 75, right? This is completely compa compatible. Uh, 65 plus minus 30 is comp compatible with 72. But you will be unhappy as a developer because this says 72 and this says 65. So uh, that's something that you then have to swallow. Uh, that is sort of, a, in some sense, is the worst case scenario. Uh, and publishing that makes you grow up. Uh, it makes it become stronger in some sense. Again, uh, because it's true. Uh, it, is comp it is not a contradiction and it is actually adding uh, data, it is adding value to your assessment. If you have a new test and you're not completely off, okay? Whatever it is. Um, so let's get back to how do we cross, do the cross validation? So the issue already was k fold. So what is the k? Now one aspect of the k in the split is oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, let me see what I can can get a. There's a red number. See? <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Whiteboard. Yeah. So, uh, let's, let's just do the simplest thing. So you have your data and you have two fold split. K equals two. So now moving from K equals two, uh, and let's just assume we have a two fold split uh, to a K not entirely sure how to do it, 10. So we have a 10 here. So we do 10 splits. One tenth of the data set is used for, for testing. 90% of the data are used for training. What's the difference between k equals 2 and k equals 10? So doing it 10 times and doing it 2 times. So one difference, of course, is you have to do it 10 times and the other one you have to do it two times. If you use a lot of CPU, uh, in one case you use five times more, right? That, that's one reality. What else? Yeah? Well, for k equals 10, my validation set is going to be very small and this might be problematic in some cases. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So typically, I'm sorry, I, um, yes, I was not clear about this. Um, so you ought to absolutely rotate. So for the split of k equals 2, you use in, in version 1, you use this for train and this for test. And in version 2, you do test and train. Okay, Apple got into the Microsoft area era. Uh, it said my Apple is being used for something. In the olden days, only Microsoft did things like that. Uh, interrupt uh, presentation for some announcement. Um, so again, you flip it around. 
and for k equal 10 you have to flip it 10 times around this is why this is not 10 times as much but five times as much because here you have to flip five, five times here you have to flip 10 times uh, and you have to make sure that there are two things you have to make sure one is that there is no redundancy in between these two and the other is that every protein in your data set has been used exactly once so that you don't oversample uh, because some proteins may work mo most likely whatever you do will work better on some entities and you have to sample the way you have them because you assume that the data that you have is representative of tomorrow okay so in that sense the number of proteins for which you finally will publish the result is exactly the same right so it's just derived in a different way but you, you will report the average over the same number of proteins you will report only the test average and that would be the same number of proteins yes yes sir yes yes no, that does not. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. I believe I'm not. I was not quite clear about that. So uh, here is is protein A, and here is protein B. And one way to say to define redundancy between A and B is that the percentage sequence identity between them is lower than than some threshold theta. Okay. If not. I could have a pair of AB where A is in the training set and B is in the testing set that are so similar that ultimately my device does a simple sequence alignment. Saying A and B have 100% sequence identity, okay, then all I sort of learn is that A is B in terms of sequence. That's all my method will ever learn. It will learn nothing about localization. It will just learn something about localizations related to sequence and sequences are similar, so end. Right? In that sense, by that definition, that is the definition of no redundancy, no sequence similarity. Such I can so I cannot do that inference. Now, this means that any pair in those in this circle will be below this sequence identity. Once you have guaranteed that, you can completely randomly choose which how you split the circle. But you must still be sure that every protein here is sampled once. Every protein sampled once means it's sampled exactly as often as you have it in your data. And that is not redundancy. So maybe your data still contains some redundancy. But what is important is that the theta here is chosen such that by this sequence, by another method being alignment method here, you cannot do better than what you expect to achieve with your method. That defines redundancy. The theta is somehow the definition of redundancy. And the, the reason for the definition of redundancy is that if I looked at the sequence comparison between the two, I could not infer that they have, in fact, the same pairing. Okay? And um, what are some typical values for this threshold? So, this again, what we, I had a couple of these curves for localization. We typically believe that in the, in the ballpark, two proteins are related in terms of subcellular localization if this number is in the ballpark of 60, 60 and higher. For enzymatic activity, we believe it ought to be a little bit lower than that. For protein protein interaction, it should be even lower than that. Okay, what about structure? Structure is higher. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, lower and higher. I'm, I'm, I, 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 sorry. I, okay. Uh, when I look at how much it's conserved, uh, structure falls off at something that, that relates, it's an HVAL really, but that relates to uh, over 100 residues. If I had only lines of 100 residues, so at 30% sequence identity. Uh, while at 30% sequence identity, uh, so subcellular localization inference is less, above it is less accurate, so this curve drops more, uh, and then it, it, it goes into something like this. Uh, for 
enzymatic activity, the curve is, is somewhere like this. So enzymatic activity, so this is localization. This is 3D localization and that is EC and protein interaction pairs will be somewhere like that. So you require the percentage sequence identity must be higher so that you can safely infer it than for 3D structure. And ultimately that means in evolution it's much easier to maintain a structure. For instance, uh, well easier is, is, is an interpretation. Uh, it's more observed. This could be because there's more pressure. It could be more complicated but the more pressure put upon the system. So the word easier is not quite, quite right here. Um, okay, so back to my question. So we do the same experiment for both. My average that I will report in the k equals 10 and the k equals 2 will be on the same set of, say, 1,000 proteins. Okay? Or, as we talk about uh, protein-protein interaction, protein pairs. Yeah? Are your networks sensitive to the order of the training samples? Yes. So, unfortunately, so, yes, they are. So now what you have to do is the way you pull them in ought to be such that you're not putting your system in a particular corner of the space. Say, let's, let's before we get into protein interactions, uh, the story is more complicated here. Let's talk about localization. You should not first train on all nuclear proteins. Because then the system, the optimization of the parameter will go into a direction of where, where nuclear proteins are best separated. So you, what you ideally want is randomly sample them, which could be that you have a couple of nuclear protein coming after each other, but they should be interspersed by others. Okay? In that sense, the, the order matters a lot. Now, having said that, essentially any kind of random split or random, random choice of the way you train is sort of okay. That, again, there is this uh, issue with balanced. Uh, now, what I said so far means that I don't care about positives and negatives if I had a two-way two split. Uh, two. So, in the example that I showed before, I had protein interaction and not, <coughs> not protein interaction, right? <coughs> and splitting them at random means I take the bias that I have in my, in my real data, which means that most, proteins, most residues that I train are not interacting. In fact, about 20% are interacting, so 80% of my data would be non-interacting. <clears throat> and in balance training, I try to sort of present at every single time point one from uh, binding and one from non-binding. So that's another way to sort of bias the training in a non-bad non way in some sense. But what would be really bad if you, if you went residue by residue? Okay. Uh, back to the question. K equals 10 versus K, K equals 2. And it comes back to essentially something that you said. Uh, at least that is how I understood your comment. Uh, maybe if K equals, well, the default way, maybe equal K equals 2 is the default way, and I could do K equals 10. Equal 10. Uh, again, my report will be on the same as the 1000 proteins, whether it's K10 or K2. What's the difference? One time we train on 900 proteins and one time on 500. So yes. 900 is preferable. Yes. Now we get into the big issue, what exactly you mean by the word preferable. So the k equal 10 is likely to give you a higher estimate for your performance. Now we get into this issue. One thing that you try to optimize is to make your method as good as possible. And that is this direction that you're talking about, right? Uh, another thing that you're trying to establish is that your number that you publish, that the number you publish, is actually right. So maybe this is getting too much into the direction of overtraining. At, for k equals 10 versus k equals 2, I don't know. But the moment you get into k equal 999, which in fact many people do, uh, then we get into the point, every publication that used k equals 999 that I've seen 
they overestimated performance. 99% of the other publications that used k equal 10 also overestimated performance. So my statement is not a very, very uh, meaningful one. But uh, people who tend to, to have a higher k tend to overestimate more. That is a correlation. Okay. Now, what Weka typically implements is this regular, in that sense, twofold split, not in the sense of k twofold. So in this particular case, what I show here is a k equals 4. Uh, a k, k equals 4, yes, uh, of a twofold split. So you have a training and a testing. It's exactly what I showed you on the whiteboard. Uh, I've told you that this is not enough. You really need three data sets. You need a, whatever you call it, I tend to call it cross for the day, a cross training set. And there are not many people who, who use this term. The only reason why I like cross training is because it reminds you when you see that word, this has to do with training. It is something that you do. You use this cross-training set to optimize some free parameters. The free parameters could, for instance, be what is my best machine learning device? So I'm running an SVM, I'm running a neural network, I'm running a random forest. Which of these three is best? Typically, people do this on the test set, and that they should not do because the test set should never be looked at. This is what you have to optimize on the cross-training set. So again, it's part of training, it's part of optimization, it's part of the development. It's part of you trying to get the best possible method. That's why I call it cross-training. Okay? Now, in the literature you will find that sometimes this is called validation in this testing, and sometimes they swap. So this is testing and this is validation. That already is some confusion that exists. Uh, since nobody uses cross-training, that confusion doesn't exist with cross-training. Um, <coughs> Anyway, so you need at least these three data sets, okay? And then, so I already talked about that. Uh, you need to make sure that you have entities that are not redundant. So that, let's call them in these, in these groups here. Uh, whenever you have things that are related that are below uh, that are above this threshold here, uh, then they have to be part of the same set. So you can use redundancy within a training set. Sometimes that can help you because your training set may be too small. Okay? Then you do introduce redundant information. So not very, very much different. But it may help you. So again, in many examples that we recently have been working on, using something such as this for the training helped us bring in redundant information. You have to be careful. You should not put in the redundant information for testing. Because, well, again, this, is, this ultimately is sort of a... Uh, an experience way, uh, because ultimately you may be estimating that you perform very high simply because you have a large test set of a family for which you perform very well. In fact, we did a deep train, a deep learning on protein-protein uh, interaction predictions, and <clears throat> what we found out was that the device completely zoomed into one particular protein family. So where we had, <coughs> because the data was so small in that particular case, uh, where we in fact had used a redundant data set for the test set, and that was what the network completely zoomed into, and that's the only thing that performed. And only by sort of clustering our test set, we found out that essentially only one protein worked uh, of hundreds. Uh, anyway, so you have to cluster. Sorry? Yeah? Uh, this uh, scenario, like the more dynamic exactly the training data, so it will like uh, the model will learn more about this data that has like more. Uh, so when you say you, you, you train on redundant data, is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, that is the danger. You're right, Isa, that is the danger. So the more redundancy you put into, and actually this is, will be something that will be particularly difficult for the context here of protein protein interaction predictions. Uh, it is true what you say. So the more redundancy you put in, the more sort of you make the, the training set become more dominant in some sense, and that could mean that you help it to overtrain. But where it worked in our case were situations where the training set was so small that we did not help to overtrain, but we helped to find something new. The alternative, if you have a tiny data set, the alternative is you present it again and again and again. And if it, there is not enough data in it, then an addition of a little bit of even redundant data may help. 
it may not. So we have had examples where it did not help. Okay? Where something such as uh, overtraining became more rapid. Yes, but we have three publications uh, pending at the moment and they all benefited from bringing in redundant information. By the way, localization was one of those examples. We used also uh, redundant information to some extent at least. Okay, so then that is still not enough. Uh, I to we talked about this find what Swissport added, Constantine said, uh, over the period that he worked on it. And in some sense, so uh, a long time ago I published a paper um, and that is me in a, in, a, in a little bit younger version. Uh, and so this, this estimate here lived on for, for decades. Uh, and that is because we spent a lot of time uh, on establishing that. Uh, now, another way to really make sure that your cross validation works is this example of the hotspots where I said we can predict some of the hotspots here at a high level of accuracy and we can do that although our device has never really learned the idea of a hotspot. So we never trained on hotspots. Hotspots was not anything that this method was trained on. It was only trained on proteins have bind to other proteins, uh, residues bind to other proteins or not. Okay? We did not distinguish in this binding. The, the network was never trained on some of those are hotspots. It saw all the binding residues. That's all it saw. And if that can then predict hotspots, then you have extracted some truth. You have been able to generalize even if you cannot measure it. And you cannot measure it on the level of uh, predicting which residue binds to other things. This is a hotspot, a different measurement, right? Uh, so that's another way in which you can prove that you have generalized. Uh, now, here, here's a different story I'd like to go into. Uh, we have gone into it already. Uh, just like to repeat it. And I believe with this one I will, for, will have to close today. I, have to, I come late and I, I leave early today. Uh, and I'm sorry for that. Um, so we have three different methods here. Uh, these two have the same features. They use a different machine learning device. This one also uses a different feature set, uses the same machine learning SVM as this one. Uh, and those are the performance values. Okay? So the, the first statement would be method three is best and performs at 37% accuracy. Is that conclusion correct? And in order to make that statement, there's a couple of things you have to ask, and it's by now hopefully trivial. Constantine? We need error bars. We need error bars, yes. We need plus minus something else that you need. So you need the same features, or you need to have the same input data in order to compare the that's a very important one that I'm not even sure that I pointed out at this point. So I give you numbers here. I never even tell you that they are compiled on the same data set. Okay? This is very, very important. So you need to compare these numbers on the same test set. Okay? Now you went a step further. You said we need exactly the same conditions. Do you really? So my question is, uh, let's get back to the story that I had here with the K10 and the K2. In both cases, say these numbers here would be on the same thousand proteins. But one used K equal 10 and one used K equal 2. Does it matter? If you had error estimates. Does it matter? Yes, it matters because if you need yeah. less data to perform roughly in the same ballpark, <laughs> it's very good. Yes, but does that invalidate that statement? This one. If 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 so, say uh, the, the the say the story would be different. Sorry, the story would be that uh, method two and method three, method three is the best. Method two, method three would be method would be the same uh, features, the same mach machine learning device. 
So what be features one features one here, SVM in both cases. The only difference is one use k equals two and one equals k equals uh, ten. The question is, and I would have a standard error here of one uh, 0 0.1 percentage point to make sure that these differences are significant. Would that invalidate the statement? So the only difference between method two and three in this, in this new idea, in this new method, is that one used k equals two and one equal k equals ten in order to derive those numbers. And you're right. So one had more opportunity to learn more. But my question is, if we establish by error bars statistically, statistically the significant difference, does that invalidate that statement? we see the machine learning devices, the black box that we, you mentioned earlier, then I would say not, because then we're only interested in prediction. That is a big can. Uh, and that can, we are, I'm going to keep the lid on. I really don't have the time. Uh, I keep this as a black box. I will open this black box issue uh, on Thursday. And if you help me, I will also address more explicitly your question. Uh, but let's stay on your last part of the statement. Uh, if we don't care about details, such as maybe they could have done better, the fact is they do better, right? So in that sense, these details may not matter. So now, back to the example that I show here. We do have two different feature sets here. Okay? And let's just assume that we have the same proteins. And let's just assume that this is statistically significant. Then if it uses different features, the method three is better. And maybe the reason then is, or the, in this particular case, because both of them are ISVM, most likely, or at least possibly, the reason is that the features are better, right? Uh, and that is what drives this, this increase. So in that sense, this is a relative statement. Um, another thing that, that was missing uh, was how good is random uh, and what is sort of the best method that you can achieve. Uh, so somehow you, you have to at least put it into perspective of random. And in this particular case here, maybe I should choose my, my example slightly different. Um, what we do see is that method three is sort of slightly, so I should put the, uh, the error estimate to 0.5 to make it more clear. Uh, in, a, in an error estimate of 0.5, you clearly, method three is clearly away from method two. But you also see that all of these methods are pretty close to random. While, yes, you do improve, and the example that I showed you that was only through the better features, uh, you're not improving by much. And that brings us to the next issue then again, is that scientifically significant? Um, but ultimately, we can predict. And that is the, the, the part that I want to uh, open on Thursday. Do we now understand? Let me keep it as the question. See you on Thursday. Thank you for your attention.